Today we're going to continue our study of gases. Specifically, we're going to look at two laws, Boyle's and Charles, and actually even mention a third law, Gay-Lussac, and also talk about the role pressure plays in gas calculations. First of all, how should you think of gases? Now, it helps if you visualize gases as we do these problems, and think about gases, unlike at solids and liquids, that they are spread far apart. And we see here we have two diatomic gases. So, for example, it could be something like H2, and possibly O2 or any other diatomic gas. We know they're diatomic because there's two particles and they're gases because they're spread far apart. Now, so these gases are in constant random motion and their pressure is caused by them hitting the sides of the container. So pressure is going to increase if they hit the container more often and they hit the inner, uh, container with more energy. And as you increase temperature, you'll see that both of those things occur. So first of all, pressure. What is air pressure? Now, how we measure air pressure is a, the, that pressure that's constantly pushing down. Now, actually, this pressure is in all directions. The way we measure this is, let's say we have a container, and this contains mercury, and it is allowed to flow up into this column. So as it flows up into the column, the, the height at which it flows, it should be proportional to the pressure that's pushing down on the mercury. And standard atmospheric pressure we see listed here is 760 millimeters of mercury. We actually have four units of pressure we're going to be using, and all those in standard units are listed here. So we have one atmosphere, 760 millimeters of mercury, also 760 torr, and 101.3 kPa's. All four of these are considered, considered standard pressure in our units we're going to use over and over in the course. So pressure is really the force of those particles hitting the sides of the container. Now pressure we know changes if you go up in altitude or as you go down a mountain. We'll talk about that separately in another video. But just visualize pressure as these particles we see here hitting the sides of the container. So let's start with gas laws. Now we're going to look specifically at two gas laws where the conditions change. So, and that is going to be one category of gas laws. Now what we're going to do is look at one, one formula that we're going to have to sort of derive all these formulas from. And this is, this is formula PV equals an RT. So we're going to use this to derive all the gas laws. So if you rearrange that, you'll get R is equal to PV over NT. And we can change that to say that P1 times V1 is equal to N over N1 times T1 is equal to P2 times V2 over N2 times T2. Now what does all this mean? This means the 1 and the 2 means different conditions. So the 1 would be one set of conditions. The 2 would be a separate set of conditions. So, for example, in a formula, we'll, we see that there are four different variables. And I wrote what each of those mean here. We have, sorry, we have a P for pressure. We have a V for volume. N represents number of moles. And T represents temperature. So what you want to look, do is look and see did the pressure, volume, number of moles, or temperature change? Typically it could be three of these, two of these, or just one of these could change. And then you'd see how they are the first time and how they are in the second conditions. So let's see how that works in a problem. First we're going to look at Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law is actually where pressure and volume are inverse and they change, while temperature and the number of moles are constant. So how do we get this formula? We'll start, first we'll start the formula we looked at last time which is P1 times V1 over N1 times T1 is equal to P2 times V2 over N2 times T2. So if something's held constant, that is actually removed from the equation because it's basically like you're doing the same side, of the, 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 you're multiplying or dividing by that same number on both sides of the equation. So since N and T are held constant, we can actually take those out of the equation. So first I'm going to remove N, and then second I'm going to remove T. And what's left when I remove both those is a formula for Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law is actually P1 times V1 is equal to P2 times V2. So how does that look, or what, how does this apply? So what happens to volume as pressure is changed? So what we see here is we have pressure of one atmosphere, a pressure of two atmospheres, and then a pressure of four atmospheres. Now you notice as a, this is a lower pressure, and you have a volume of four liters. Then what happens, we decrease that by half, but the volume actually doubles. And then we actually go up to four uh, atmospheres of pressure. So the pressure is four times greater than initially. But now the volume is four times uh, less. So we say those values for Boyle's Law are inverse. So as one increases, the other uh, decreases proportionally.
So let's do a problem with Boyle's Law. So the, uh, the, the, here's a graph of the relationship of Boyle's Law before we do that. As we see, as we, as we increase the pressure, the volume gets smaller and smaller. And notice it never actually decreases to zero because those gas particles get closer and closer together. And so when they get closer and closer together as we're increasing the pressure, the volume actually never goes completely down to zero. So here we have increase in pressure, and the volume gets, now if you decrease the, the pressure, particles are able to move further apart. And if they're moving further apart, they do not hit the sides of the container as often, and so the, so the pressure is smaller, and of course the volume is also bigger. So Boyle's Law, we say, is P1 times V1 is equal to P2 times V2, because number of moles and temperature are held constant. And here's another drawing that represents that with weights. We see as we increase the number of weights, we're increasing the pressure, the, the volume gets smaller. Now, as you see this, you see how many more particles are in a smaller area. So the particles are going to hit the side of the container more often. And so there's going to be a greater pressure in this one right here, the final one. Not, not only we see that because of the number, uh, the number of weights are there, but we see these particles, the gas particles, are going to be colliding with the sides of the container much more often. Now, the speed is going to actually be the same because the temperature hasn't changed. But the number of particles hitting the side of the container at one time is going to be much greater because there's more sides of the, of the uh, more p particles per volume in this last container. We call, we'll call, call it container three than there is in any of the other containers. Like in the first container, we'll call this container one. The particles are far apart, and so per volume, they don't hit the sides of the container as often. So let's do a problem with Boyle's Law. So here's the problem with Boyle's Law. A balloon contains three liters of helium, and it's at a pressure of 103 kPa's, which stands for kilopascals. What is the volume when its pressure is reduced to 25 kilopascals? Now you see here, both of your pressure units are in the same unit. If they're not, you'll need to make sure you convert them so they're always in the same unit. So first, we're going to start with this formula, and we know that n and t are all constant. And so what's left is Boyle's Law, which is P1 times V1 is equal to P2 times V2. So we're going to use Boyle's Law. So there's three steps of that. So we rearrange Boyle's Law to find V2. And when we do that, we get V2 is equal to V1 times P1 over P2. So next thing we want to do is substitute our values. So we start with V1, which is 3 liters. Then we multiply by P1 over P2. So, and you notice when you do that, your kilopascals cancel out. And so you multiply 30 times 103 and divide by 25. And you get your final volume, which is 124 liters. Now also you want to think about this with, with the idea of the concepts in mind. Notice for this, the pressure was decreased. We know that with Boyle's Law, pressure and volume are inverse. So if you decrease pressure, so if pressure is decreased, we should have an increase in volume. So if you have a number that doesn't get bigger, you should know you probably did something wrong in your calculation. So that's how you do one with Boyle's Law. Now let's go to, uh, so I think those are all the values. Next, now let's go to Charles Law. Charles Law. Volume and temperature change directly while pressure and number of moles are constant. So that means we want to get rid of pressure. We want to get rid of number of moles. And what's left is a formula for Charles Law, which is V1, and we see there's Charles Law. Uh, Let's go back to that. Sorry. So the formula for Charles' law would be V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. Now notice what we've changed here are the temperatures. Here it's minus 65 degrees Celsius, so it's very cold. And here we've heated the temperature up a lot. So by heating the temperature up, it's caused the particles to move faster. And the pressures, notice the pressure, which is represented by the, the mass is pushing down the container, has not changed. So since the pressure is not, not changed, the particles are moving faster, thus, thus they have enough energy to hit the side of the container and move that up a little bit higher. So for that reason, when the temperature is increased, it's going to make the volume bigger. Now let's look at a graph and see how this would look. So the relationship between volume and temperature is, is that they change directly. So notice our formula, we're going to get rid of pressure and number of moles here. 
pressure, number of moles. So we have volume over temperature equals volume over temperature. So as you increase the temperature, volume changes directly. Now one thing we've talked about is when you do these problems, you always need to change your temperature to Kelvin. Here's an illustration of why. Now if you look at this, if we leave this in Celsius, it would stop, the relationship between volume and temperature would start right, stop right here, right between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius. But if we were to change this to Kelvin, it would go all the way to negative 273, which is about right here. So we see there's a, this graph would, would work perfectly if we change all these units to Kelvin, and the units for volume wouldn't be in the center. So you notice here, pressure's the same, the, the weights represent the pressure, but this represents a higher temperature. So if you increase the temperature, particles move faster, and they cause a greater volume, and when a, with a greater volume, you have a, have a direct relationship, increase in temperature, increase in volume. So one, one thing to think about when, when you increase temperature, particles have uh, moved faster, and they hit the sides of the container more often. So with that, since we're not making a container rigid, the volume is able to increase. Let's do a problem with Charles' Law. So here's an example. A balloon is inflated to a, a room to, at room temperature at 24 degrees Celsius has a volume of 4 liters. And then it's heated to 58, so we see the temperature is increased. So we would expect increase in temperature would lead to an increase in volume. Now let's see if we can do a problem for this. So we have the formula here, so we know volume and temperature are the only thing we're going to be concerned with. Volume 1 over temperature 1 is equal to volume 2 over temperature 2. So that's Charles' law right here. So this is the law that we're using. So what you can do is rearrange that. Solve for your V2 because that's our unknown. We have both temperatures and we have the first volume. So, and remember, temperature must always be expressed in Kelvin. And that means you're going to add the number 2, sorry, 273 uh, to the number in Celsius to get your Kelvin temperature. So, we rearrange this and we say v, we get V1 times T1, I'm sorry, V1 times T2 over T1 is equal to V2. Now we're ready to insert the values. So we have our first volume and we multiply by the second temperature over the first temperature. We see that these temperature values of Kelvin cancel out. When we multiply this out, we get an answer of 4.46 liters, which is what we'd expect because initially we had a 4 liters, but we increased the temperature and we, we got an increase in volume. Notice we, we more than double the temperature here in Celsius, but we didn't double the volume. That's because it wasn't in Kelvin. If the temperature, would, if we double the Kelvin temperature, that would also double the volume. But that doubling of both volume and temperature only works if the temperature is in Kelvin and that's doubled. One last idea we want to look at is this called Gay-Lussac law. Let's look at a situation here with Gay-Lussac law. So in this one, the, an example of this would be also if you took an aerosol can and put it in a flame. Now notice this represents a rigid container right here. So here we have a rigid container, and here is outside of room temperature. But here the, the rigid container is put in liquid nitrogen, which is extremely cold. So what happens, we see that the volume can't change, so we're going to cross out volume, and the number of moles can't change because it's a rigid container. So the formula for Gay-Lussac law would be P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. Now what happens here, th these vary the same way. If you, here, here we decrease the temperature, which would lead to also a decrease in pressure. Now that should make sense because if you decrease the temperature, particles are moving more slowly. If they move more slowly, they'll hit this, the sides of the container less often and with less speed, and this will have lower pressure because we've made the container rigid. The opposite example of this would be if you took a rigid container, an example would be an aerosol can, and you threw it into flame. You should know not to do that because that aerosol can can explode. Why can't it? Because when you put it in that flame, you increase, the flame increases the temperature, and what happens when you increase temperature, you also increase pressure. 
because the particles are moving faster and faster and hitting the sides of the container more and more often. At some point when it's so hot, and it, if you have an aerosol can or a can that's closed inside of a flame, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to explode. And that's why we've got to be very careful and not put any closed container in, in, in an uh, open flame. So this will conclude our session and we'll work on some problems tomorrow. Thanks.